I am gonna beat you into the living death. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Walkout Network. It's your man, Ant Walker, here with the next edition of the Living Death Show. I'm very happy this week because this is the reunion that you've been waiting for. This is a guy who you've seen on the Walkout Network many times. We work together a lot at the Body Lock. We work together at Sherdog as well. And it's always a pleasure to have him on. My man, Patty Dukes, Pat OJ. You know him as the Fight Business Podcast Maestro. It's good to see you, man. How you doing? It's good to see you too, man. I'm doing doing well. I'm glad glad we could get back together. It's been too long. Been far been too, too long. I, I I feel like really feeling like holding your hand right now. This is this is a beautiful moment. <laughs> oh, I, I feel. Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, 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 oh wait, uh, this... over here. Over, uh, over uh, there. Uh, there it is. All right. <laughs> All right. Now with that foolishness out the way, let's go ahead and introduce two very serious men who do very serious work here on the Walkout Network. <laughs> First up, you can't, can't even say that shit with a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the jack of all trades who has mastered them all. He is a senior editor of Sherdog.com. Also, my good friend, Mr. Ben Duffy. What's up, Ben? Hey, man. I'm not sure I've mastered the trade of getting up this early in the afternoon, but it is good <laughs> to see you all again. Always good to see Pat. Just seems like yesterday that we first met out in the uh, greater Waco metropolitan area, you know, and, and he's been my man ever since. So good to see you again, Pat. Good thing you yeah, rescued man. him from the Branch Davidians. All right, so. <laughs> so no, that shit might still have been on fire. Just, I mean, it was like almost, 2018. Almost. Just got a little bit of flame on the ass, but you got out all, yeah. all right. All right, so, of course, we've got the, <laughs> the man who holds the panel every week with the stats, the facts, the figures, and the numbers, the associate editor of Sherdog.com and the homie, Jay Petrie. What's up, Jay? Well, I, I guess I'll express the same thing. I'm, I'm happy Pat's here, too. And I'm happy that, uh, if I haven't said it already, that, that Pat's with us again at Sherdog. Um, I, I really enjoy what we're doing now with the Sherdog podcast network, not just the radio network. And, and Fight Business is a perfect addition for our growing, blossoming, burgeoning lineup that we are not a part of because we are independent. And not speaking of independent, because I don't actually have a good transition here, stat of the week is 200. 200 is our stat of the week. Uh, and, and that's an oddity right here because Bellator 273 happened this weekend. And something that doesn't happen basically ever is that all on the main card of Bellator 273, all of the underdogs won. Like Bellator is a company that the favorites win like 80% of their fights. It's absurd. It's crazy. We joke about it sometimes. We're like, well, I guess I wonder how this is going to turn out. And all four betting underdogs won their fight. It's the first time in 200 events. So Bellator 73 is the last time all the underdogs won on the main card, and that was the only other time it happened. So 200 Bellator, let's get weird. Absolutely. So let's let's keep that train going. Uh, Bellator 273 uh, took place this weekend. Also, Eagle FC 44, the first time that Khabib Nurmagomedov, former UFC champion, um, is in the role of the promoter uh, running that show. Which one felt like the bigger card? I know last week we didn't give any love to Eagle FC. We, I, I'm, I'm not even sure if we really mentioned it at all. At the time, there wasn't really, the time we recorded, there wasn't any concrete announcement on how to even watch it. So it just kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but in hindsight, which one felt the most important this weekend? Pat, I'll begin with you. Man, I don't know. It's weird. I, I would have... Love to see them go head to head because I think that would have been really interesting. But I will say this: Ego FC got way more attention than I expected it to get. Way, way more attention. Uh, and even if they didn't feel quite as important as Bellator, which I think Bellator was a little bit more important, just because you didn't have any major title fight in Ego FC or anything like that. Um, I, I mean, it was one of those things where I'm shocked that that it. Eagle FC is already that big. And I think that it will be, as it continues to grow, if you get more UFC vets, you get bigger names, and you get some good fights in the main event, I could easily see it overpassing Bellator. This weekend, I give Bellator the slight edge. But that's that's not great for Bellator. Your heavyweight belt being defended, and you are only a slightly more important than Eagle FC. <laughs> yeah, that's um, definitely kind of, kind of damning. But... Kind of staying in that in that that line of thought here. 
long term though is bellator doing it the right way i mean we've had a lot of promotions come up in their first event or the new ownership or new management we we can think back to affliction for instance and they made a huge splash their first event um operating and it was actually rivaling the ufc as far as as far as numbers as far as attention um drawn to it is eagle fc kind of flying too close to the sun by getting at least on par with bellator in their first gate um their first gate out with uh khabib at the helm uh it it'll it really depends on what they're paying these guys because they had a couple of recognizable names on there basically just to feed to the russians uh but i don't i didn't see i don't know how much they paid just for example rashad evans to to show up and fight because i mean he, he was a name for the marquee that i mean it piqued a little bit of interest but it's not sustainable like i'm sure we're going to get to evan saying i'm back but that's not I mean, he's not something you're going to build your new promotion around. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Bellator has, has done it the right way. All, all, the only argument you need for that is that they've been around for 13 years now. I mean, they're easily the longest-lived promotion to ever go head-to-head with the UFC and or, like, settle into that number two promotion role. Like, Bellator has done it right. They, they've all, – all their silliness aside, all their – master circuit for washed up ufc heavyweights aside which thank goodness they they finally seem to be like aging out of yeah they've, they've done it right with, with eagle fc it's not as though they popped in there like affliction and just paid monstrous uh unsustainable paychecks to like big star names you know they're not paying to have like megadeth playing in between their uh in between their fights uh yeah, I mean, Eagle FC, if they keep on like this, they're going to run into the same problem as PFL, where their best fighters are just a bunch of interchangeable Dagestani guys with 15 letter last names. You know, and how are you going to get your product into uh, the average fan's mind and have them care about your next show? And therein lies a very interesting question that a lot of people asked about this promotion. This is the forty the forty fourth fight card this company's ever put on, and it's the first I've ever heard of them. Now, there's a few things to, to to explain there because Eagle is now Eagle Fight Club instead of Eagle Fighting Championship. That's one thing. Uh, Khabib bought the organization at the end of 2020 and has staged a bunch of events since then. Before that, it was actually called Guerrilla Fighting Championship (GFC), which was weird. I know a sponsorship with the Gorilla Energy Drink overseas. So it was a really bizarre uh, kind of partnership. Uh, think of uh, Bellator's Monster Energy Series that ran with NASCAR. You forgot about that? Yeah, most of us did too. But that's that's the odd level of, of GFC. Now, Duffy is right on the money in that they, they, the Eagle Company, spend a lot of money putting aging fighters on the top of the marquee. Sergey Karatanov is one of the youngest guys fighting. I mean, besides like Gabriel Checo and Karatanov is 40 something, 42, 41. Um, and he clearly is not in the best shape of his career, but he still managed to, to ride out Tyron Spong because all he had to do was go and Tyron Spong fell over. Now, you can't build a brand on Rashad Evans. And Ray Borg was very clear to say, I want to go back to the UFC. So that means you got to go down to the four part to see Ramazan Kuromagomedov and go, okay, he's 10 and 0. Well, that means he's probably not sticking around. So I don't know how Eagle can build a brand other than specifically being, we're going to farm out, grab some hot shot, uh, uh, free agents, aging names uh, to fill in the lines on one fight deals. See also Diego Sanchez, Kevin Lee, which is a, an absurd matchup they're doing uh, at Eagle 46 back in Miami to, to have it around here. So it seems like Eagle wants to have it both ways. Eagle's going to stage its events. By the way, Eagle actually held another event this past weekend, uh, Eagle Selection 4, which a bunch of O and O and 1 and O no, names we've never heard of and probably never will hear of again, uh, competed to try and, you know, they're the own branch of, of Challenger Series and then will come to America and have this kind of blockbuster thing uh, uh taking a peek behind the curtain um in terms of metrics the metrics i had at my disposal eagle did just a smidge like not like five percent eight percent less traffic than bellator's 
heavyweight title unification match. The biggest, heaviest, you know, the the baddest number two man on the planet, or whatever you want to call him. And and that was, you know, Bellator trying to do whatever they could. Uh, so Bellator is in a weird spot uh, because this is a card that I very clearly lampooned last week and was right for 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 a part of it. What do you, what do you expect is going to happen when a, a minus eleven hundred guy gets in there? Well, he styles on some guy and hits some bizarro arm triangle guillotine weird thing because the other guy couldn't you know didn't had no what the heck he was doing here. But I will say one last thing because I'm going on forever. The UFC won this weekend. The UFC won without staging an event. Why? Who won on all of these cards, on all of these events people were paying attention to? Ryan Bader, tough winner, UFC longtime name. Ben Henderson, former UFC champion. Sabah Humasi, former UFC talent. Enrique Barzola just left the UFC. And then you go to Eagle. Well, who won there? Rashad Evans, former UFC champion. Ray Borg wants to get back there. In pillow fighting championship, Marcus Perez stole all the headlines by almost getting into a real fight at the end of his pillow fight. So Marcus Perez, former UFC name, won pillow fight FC. Who won in the Royal Rumble? Ronda Rousey, former UFC champion. Brock Lesnar, former UFC champion. This was the UFC's weekend without having to stage a card, and that was fascinating to me. Wow. Uh, very good points there. UFC's ghost was kind of all over a UFC less weekend. Um, but let's let's talk about some of the specific fights that we saw over the weekend. You know, and we'll start with this topic mainly because this fighter is someone that I've it was a big part of my fandom um, some, some years ago. Rashad Evans uh, breaking his five fight losing streak, getting in the win column. Uh, afterward claiming that this is this was a comeback like this is him trying to restart his career i mean how do how do we feel about that not good that's it Concerned. that's all i have to say yeah terrible no. hang him up you won <laughs> go out on a win hang him up been hung up <laughs> hang him up again <laughs> yeah as, I mean, this as, was... oh ben please i was gonna say i mean this was a, a nice story but he didn't just leave the sport on five straight losses. He left the sport on a couple of bad knockouts. And the, if he's going to keep fighting, if he's going to keep fighting for Eagle FC, they're eventually going to have to feed him to somebody who can really hurt him. You know, like, I, I mean, I said a few minutes ago, I don't, I don't know if they're paying him like ridiculous, you know, Bellator, eight years ago level paychecks but whatever they're paying him they're, they're gonna need to get the juice you know at, at some point for what they are paying him so if he, if he fights for him again two more times they're eventually gonna run him into a killer like are they gonna have him fight sergey Haritanov in a couple fights yuck wouldn't shock me at all i mean he as the thing like rashad evans did at least approach this in the correct manner leading up to to the fight. And I think that was something that, that Chael Sonnen mentioned in the commentary was that a lot of times you ask a fighter, what what are they doing different when they come back? Um, and Rashad has done a lot of things different as far as his nutrition, as far as his exercise regimen. I know when I saw him, um, the the last time I saw him, he was noticeably slimmed down. He, he was – you know, skin glowing and everything. He felt fantastic on his vegan diet um, and I guess changing out, changing the way he worked out. It was very apparent by looking at him. However, the man is post 40 years old. You know, the gas tank was not quite what you'd like. I mean, he did have a dominant win, but he he was sucking win within the, the first round. And this is against a level of opposition that, the previous versions of Rashad, even the the lower tier Rashad that we saw take some questionable losses toward the end of his UFC run, would have run through um, a gentleman like this, a guy that that looked to be handpicked to get slaughtered by Rashad Evans, and Rashad really just control position and 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 didn't get too offensive, and you know took a lot of unnecessary leg kicks and whatnot. So I'm I'm just not optimistic about the idea of this being the start of something for him like his chapter i think is better suited staying in kamaro's corner you know being at uh was it sanford mma and and trying to foster young talent there and and sharing his wisdom 
um, as long as it isn't like Andy Fax stuff. <laughs> if if I can get on board with it for one one reason, if Eagle FC does it right, and by that I mean know what you're getting yourself into when you have Rashad Evans, former champion, aging champion, who clearly has lost a couple steps, but still has enough to 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 essentially lay and pray a guy who off his back is an opportunist mission threat, and that's about it. Um, you know, give him guys that are beatable. Give him guys in his range, his 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 tier, I suppose. Give him if they're going to do it the way I feel they could very well do it. Now that he has a win under his belt, the the eagle can say, "Yeah, we got him a win. He beat a guy who's a a jujitsu threat." Blah blah blah. Now they can give him an, another aging, uh, former whatever, maybe throwing a Vitor Belfort type. A, a name like that to drag in and have him headline a card. You, you make faces, Ben, but that's the level of it that I feel like that could prolong this weird situation that Evans is saying. Because Evans said he wants to do it again and again. Like, this wasn't a, I did it. I wanted to see if I could do it, and I did it. I'm here. I'm, no, this is a guy who said, I'm 42. I'm in the best shape of my life. Well, he's not, but he said he was. Uh, and let, Let's do it again. And, you know, he's in the right headspace for it. So he needs to get the right opposition. He does not need the the Eagle FC six and zero upstart Thundercats that are gonna you know do whatever they want to him because you know they're the twenty five year old Dagestani future. We don't want that. We want Rashad Evans to fight names he can beat or names of a similar level of experience and and, and age. I feel. I, I think one thing that works to his advantage in in, in trying to run down a path like that is we got to look at who runs this promotion and who is who else is behind the scenes and their connection to Rashad Evans. Rashad is a member of the same uh, management squad that Khabib is under Ali Abdelaziz. It, it would be silly of us to, um, to think that Ali has nothing to do with Eagle FC at all, considering his, his very – questionable relationship with PFL in the past or World Series of Fighting, whatever whatever you wanted to call the organization at the time. Um, I really think that that could be a reason why Rashad is going to get protected um, going forward. Like, there might come a time where you have to put him as a sacrificial lamb, but he probably has a few more fights at least to where they can ride this out. I mean, I'm sure you can dig some more opposition like – uh, like your man that, that they just threw in there uh, Saturday. Well, I mean, they're going to end up gutting LFA's middleweight division if they keep doing it. I mean, dude, Gabriel Checo wasn't even the best middleweight in LFA. Like, Ian Heinrich killed him. Yeah. I mean, but he'll be... The thing is, like, an organization like LFA will find more people. Like, that. it's it's, it's going to be no shortage of people to fill out the, the lower tiers of regional promotion. And, and it might be a guy like Aaron Jeffrey, who just won this weekend at Cage Fury, uh, former LFA talent at 185er. Good skills, good look. He's got the hair, and he's very beatable, especially in, in a Rashad situation. So, yes, yeah, so it's definitely some, some options out there. I wasn't really expressing concern for LFA's middleweight division. I was just pointing <laughs> oh. out where they're having to find people that Rashad can beat. Oh, and okay. how long yeah. that's going to be interesting to watch. Oh, well, excuse Until me, Until the wheels Tyler. fall off. <laughs> I, mean, I, hey, I am. I love LFA. <laughs> Leave their middleweight division hey, low. So, so Ben, I know, I know you are a big LFA guy. So I, you know, I just thought you were taking hey, it personal. With, with Marcus Perez all tied up in pillow fighting, he's not coming back to LFA, you know, anytime soon. So that's another there's your angle. Champ gone. <laughs> there's your angle. Co-promoting Eagle pillow fighting thing and have Rashad fight Marcus Perez in the pillow and then in the fight. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying, call me, call me. Yeah, you uh, say that now, and when Rashad gets rocked by a pillow, you're going to feel bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys, let's, let's keep things pushing because um, got a got a question I want to throw out there. We did have a heavyweight title unification of sorts this weekend at, at Bellator. Um, we also had one in the last uh, UFC outing between Ngannou and Gon. So, which one, in your eyes, was worse, gentlemen? Ngannou versus Gan or Bader versus Moldovsky? Uh, for me, it's clear it's Bader versus Moldovsky because, A, 
Ngannou went into that fight with his knee just absolutely torn up, right? Like, that that wasn't anywhere near 100% Francis Ngannou. And it still looks good and did what he had to do to get the win. But, I mean, nowhere near that. B, I had to watch Ryan Bader rock Moldovsky and come this close to ending the fight in the first round, only to then grapple and extended another 23 minutes of my life that I will never get back for no reason at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the tough part. What's worse, something that you have a high expectations of and it doesn't deliver in terms of excitement, like in Ghana versus Ghana, or a fight in Bader versus Moldovsky that I wrote three paragraphs on why this fight's going to suck and it's going to go 25 minutes. What's worse? I think it's the fight that I knew was not going to be great and still was worse than I said it would be. I feel like that because when I look at the two fights, which is the one I'll ever watch again? Ooh, I still don't want to see him gone versus gone again, but I do want to see him do that big power slam thing again. So that's probably why I'll watch him gone again. So yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, Pat, you're, you're right. That, yeah, I don't, I don't have, there's nothing I could take away from that fight that I didn't know going into the fight other than, well, Bader could have finished him, didn't, and then the fight continued forever. Yeah, uh, they, this this is no contest, absolutely no contest. Like, and Gano Gone, while it didn't turn into the bloodbath that a lot of people wanted to see, it still was an entertaining technical fight. There still there still was some back and forth exchanges. There still was the the story behind it w- was enough. The story of Dana White and the UFC being at odds with its reigning heavyweight champion was enough of a cloud over that octagon to give it some level of intrigue that the fight may not have provided once the belt rung. This um, fight for Bellator this past weekend offered literally no story worth anything except for the fact that, okay, well, he's fighting another uh, another student of Fedor Emelianenko. Um, by the way, the previous one laid him out flat. And that's it. Like that, that was, that was the hook. Like, okay, this guy goes to this school to, to, to learn how to fight. And yeah, I, that's just not a good hook. And especially when you have that sort of style matchup, like it's, there was, there was no way that fight was going to be exciting anyway. It, it just wasn't like this. This was the fight that we were destined to watch. It um, was this close. It was this close to being a first round knockout being like, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It just, no. It's like that one moment <laughs> did not account for the the other twenty four minutes of of pure, just just grinding agony to get through as a viewer. So, yeah. As somebody who covered this event on play by play for Sure Dog, my heart left my chest and went yes. You know, it's like uh, in, in in Thor Ragnarok where where Hulk enters the Coliseum and he goes yes. I was so excited at the prospect that this would end right here right now and then rug me yeah. pulled out it it actually it reminded me of that that strike force nashville card when when dan henderson and jake shields fought and it was like when that fight started off you like dan henderson is knocking this guy's brain clear get yep. out of his ears yep. Yep. and then he didn't and well, I, I turned out he did but shields kept fighting yeah <laughs> well that's like, the same thing exhibit here. a shields is twitter yeah <laughs> Yeah, that that's that's sort of what I what, what I was reminded of. So, all right, fellas. So, so um, another another cool thing that happened over the weekend, as we mentioned, Ben Henderson, former UFC and WEC champion, got himself an upset win over one of Khabib Nurmagomedov's the the aforementioned UFC champion, one of his students, and actually broke the undefeated um, streak of Khabib's coaching and. Uh, his opponents uh, was it twenty and zero? I think he he came into the to the bout as well, he was on a twenty fight unbeaten streak. Yeah, overall, unbeaten he's like twenty four and two or twenty four okay. three, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So bro- broke that broke that twenty fight unbeaten streak. Broke Khabib's undefeated coaching record. Um, this is this Ben Henderson's swan song in Bellator or for MMA period? It might be his swan song in Bellator. Like this was clearly a setup fight. You know, he came into this fight on the first three fight skid of his career. They put him against, like, frankly, a killer in Mamadov. Like, I, 
you have to eat a little crow here. I know that's premature, but uh, because I just joked, I know he does not have a chance in this fight. I underestimated the man. He, you know, just he is one of the ultimate anti MMA guys at lightweight. Got a style that's built for the long haul, uh, and it wasn't complete garbage. He just flat out beat a really good fighter. Uh, he's not done, but he might be done with Bellator. Because Bellator is going to be stuck in this position where do we want to keep paying this guy a fairly premium wage to keep knock, knocking off our uh, up-and-coming contenders when we know he's probably not going to win the title? I, th- I think Bellator might end up cutting him loose. He will absolutely pop up somewhere else. Uh, he's 38. He appears to be in great health. He still has something to offer at lightweight. Not so much at welterweight. He's been overmatched even against kind of middling welterweights. Uh, you know, he's... Got, he got way too much in his head from one whipping of Brandon Thatch like five million years ago. But no, like I, I would be very, very surprised if uh, Benson Henderson were done, period. Let me throw a prediction out there. Ben Henderson fights the winner of Kevin Lee versus Diego Sanchez. Yep. That, that's, I would say that is actually probably exactly what's going to happen. There, there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that Henderson is sticking around. But in Bellator, he underperformed, I think, relative to our expectations for him. He only went six and six. Like this, I mean, and and one of his his wins over um, uh, Patricio, the two division champion, was he was losing the fight, and I think he checked a kick, and P- Patricio's leg snapped in half. So it's not, you know, it's not a clear cut, whatever. And he had a couple of split decisions on the way. Uh, he's he's king of split decision right here. He's six and two in split decisions in his career. That's that's amazing. I. Uh, I, it was a Ben Henderson fight to a T. You're like, uh oh, he's toast, and then he comes back and isn't toast at all. Um, he is perfectly suited for for an eagle uh, type promotion. Uh, throw him over in Ryzen. Go have throw him over and, and, and join the uh, the lightweight Grand Prix that that may come together next year, depending on how things shake out. Uh, something like that would be fun. Because at this at this stage in his career, I don't want to see him fight the Islam Mamadovs the, of the world, who was twenty one and one coming to this fight. Like, just don't. This was this was the best of a bad situation that he should not have done, and and uh, you know it 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 worked out for him, and it was a feel good moment. But I uh, he I don't want to say he got lucky, but you know he got Ben Henderson lucky. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I think he is going to stay stay in the sport. Um, I don't think with Bellator. It doesn't make sense. He's already fought most of Bellator's lightweight roster, and he's, he's in that middling position. Like Jay said, he's probably getting paid way too much money to be in that position. Um, I love the idea of him going over to Ryzen and doing a lightweight Grand Prix send-off, you know, trying to cap off his career that way. He is not a Rashad Evans where I would love to – to see Rashad Evans hang him up. He's taken a ton of damage. He's older. Let's let's not have him fight anymore, in my opinion. But Hendo still has some, you know, Smooth still has some moves. He, he, he fought very well. I think he could do well in a Ryzen Lightweight Grand Prix or over at Eagle FC if he's fighting the right people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he will keep on trucking at least another couple fights. I think if he gets brutally KO'd, and then, uh, like, one or two fights after this, he'll probably hang him up. But who knows? I think he's done with Bellator, though. I think that's that's accurate. And to his credit, I mean, he he's kind of a no bullshit guy. He flat out said, like, I I probably underfought my mm-hmm. contract. Like he he more or less openly said that if he resigns with Bellator, he's probably gonna have to resign for less. Yeah. Like it's just kind of refreshing to have a guy like that reel across the mic. Like, how many fighters are willing to admit something like that? It's, it's bad business. Don't do it. Never do it. Deny. It's, <laughs> he's, he's Deny. Also guy, he's, he's also a guy who who's appeared to be one of the the more intelligent uh, people in in the sport consistently, and and always had an eye on what his career could hold. I mean, keep in mind what made him leave the UFC initially. Like he he left on I think it was the win against uh, Mass Hall. I believe it was. I believe that that main event where he mm-hmm. that was his last UFC fight. Yes. And the contract he was offered, he's saying like, hey, I could get. I could get a lot of money. I could get more money than I'd get in Bellator, but it's in, it's contingent on me getting a title and having these defenses and That's whatnot. Right. And, I remember and, that. And, and him realized that probably wasn't going to happen at least as easily as, the, as uh, I guess, 
the, the UFC wanted to make it seem when he left. So this is a guy who had his eye to the future for quite some time. I, I could very well see where he just says, hey, I am i don't have that much time left. Let me cash out as much as possible and let me have some fun fights. Let me go. Um, probably, I, I would say even PFL might seem like too much of a risk. I, w- I was just about to ask you guys. PFL uh, runs the seasons. They have, they have two regular season fights, then playoffs and whatever. How does this sound for a, a, a regular season for Ben Henderson at lightweight? Anthony Pettis, three. Jeremy Stevens. I mean, he, I think he. Both of those could headline PFL cards. Yeah. I I don't think he has much trouble with with Jeremy Stevens, but I mean, and he probably could beat this version of Pettis. The problem is, like, what I'm thinking. He's lost to Pettis twice. Like, do you really want to put, you know, your, your, your hopes on that when you could easily go to another promotion and make some money with lesser competition or yeah. without that stigma over your head. Oh, you know, if you, he goes to Eagle FC in his first fight against Kevin Lee, that is not lesser competition. Oh, no, yeah, no, no, not, 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 not at all. But he probably gets a nice coin out of that one. Yeah. He, definitely, that's, definitely a main event yeah. slot too. I, I would, I would Same assume point. that's going to be more money that he gets from, from that than he would trying to work his way to the million dollars in PFL against Anthony Pettis. Um, if he makes the playoffs, he's looking at Loic Rajabov and Natan Shulton, you know, yeah. which I don't think either of those guys blows him out of the water. No. I mean, I really, no, no lightweight blows Benson Henderson out of the water. I mean, except for Pettis once when he caught lightning in a bottle, you know. So, or you can go to Ryzen. Um, you can have a fun fight with Darren Crookshank or something. And there it is. Like, that now just... I'm less excited about it. <laughs> no, I, I'm not, and here's why. Because he, because if something happens, he will grapple. He grapples very low. What? How does Ben Henderson react when soccer kicks might be coming at him? I, I think that this could be a really interesting. Or how does he react? Because he scrambles like a bolt of lightning. He knock bulls a guy over and then tries to punt him in the head. He does like his low kicks. I'm just saying the options are there yeah. still. Yeah, yeah. The different. I'm trying to excite you, Duffy. The different rules it gives us something different to look at. I think I think you have more of a possibility that he's just going to get more money for like just a fun fight that he's not going to find elsewhere. So, um, yeah, I'll I'll take I'll take Ben Henderson leaving Bellator as it sounds like the rest of the panel is agreeing as well. Is there even a one percent chance that he gets picked back up by the UFC? No, I, I, no. I can't see it. Yeah, I couldn't no. either. Because they they definitely would offer him less money. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and, and their cost cutting mode so bad right now. There's no way. I mean, they're they're. I mean, CSAC kind of you know pulled yeah. the curtain back a little bit, showing that because they're signing with a different contender series guys are signing with a different company that's a subsidiary. They can offer them less money. They're going to keep doing that. That's that going to be a whole thing. That was my, so, I'm not surprised. I mean, Falcon segment last week, my man, let me tell I'm you sh- what. I'm sure, that's, I'm sure they'd break out the, the, the 12 and 12 for him though. Ooh, oh, that's true. Yeah. That's oh, a good maybe, point. 12 and 12. Maybe, maybe 14, 14 and 14. 14. Yeah. 14, 14. That Ooh. might, that, that'd do the trick. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's never going to be in the UFC again. Um, yeah. I, I, and honestly, I wouldn't even sure where he'd fit in there other than just being a guy for the cheap talent to fight. That's that's essentially what his role would be. All right, fellas. So it's time to break out the seasoning salt, the cracked pepper, the butter for the pan, and ask that age-old question, how's Taste My Crow? Uh, Pat, I think I'll start with you this week. How's Taste My Crow? <sighs> Man, this I don't know why. Maybe it was because his v- physique reminded me but i was really high on ben parish big tuna and i was like come on come on big tuna and then big tuna got just i thought he i thought there was a solid chance he could lose but he just got mauled he just i mean it was really really bad so uh yeah that that crow doesn't taste too great i was i was hoping if he made a run maybe i'd you know throw on some some gloves and give it a shot but no no i mean that's it my dreams are dashed (laughs) <laughs> all right ben i'll say my crew this week i mean i already mentioned like i i openly mocked the idea that uh, benson henderson had any chance against islam mamadov on saturday i turned out to be dead wrong about that you know and I, again it was there was not a whole lot of smoke and mirrors it was just benson henderson doing uh what he does you know despite the fact that like i mean he's always 
looked like a magazine model or something. His game has never really run on fast twitch athleticism. It's always just kind of run on being rubbery. Just shit doesn't work on him a lot of the time. Um, and that's something that has not faded as he pushes 40. So, you know, just the fact that we had a 10 minute conversation about what 38 year old Benson Henderson does next. And none of us were screaming that he needs to retire. I mean, like there, that that's, that's all the crow that I need right there. Some nice, some nice Korean, you know, crow in a bowl with like the egg cracked on top and, you know, cool. hey, so but, but, he, but he's half black. So you got to put that soul food in there too, man. You got to I got hot sauce in my purse. All right. There we go. There we go. Hillary. All right. <laughs> All right, Jay, how's Taste My Crow this week? We, gentlemen, for this one, are going way south of the border. Now, you can mix it up. You can throw in some some lime, maybe some some squeezed uh, lemon, some some bitter orange in there. But you got to throw in some cilantro, a bit of cumin, maybe some paprika, because we're going Peruvian right here. Because in Bellator 273 prelims, I thought Darian Caldwell was going to run all over or wrestle all over uh, debuting Enrique Barzola, who I'd mentioned just came from the UFC, uh, and he had a very, very unusual distinction of fighting 10 fights with the UFC, and all 10 went to, different, to the distance. That's never happened. So that Barzola was kind of set up to be like, a, you know, oh, yeah, he fought for the UFC, but do you think you could remember any of his fights? No, neither could I, and I probably ran play-by-play -play on five of them. So we expected Darren Caldwell, oh, I expected Darren Caldwell would do whatever he wanted to do to, 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 to him, but that didn't happen. Caldwell ran out of steam. About second round, he started his his expression started changing, and Enrique Barzola finished the fight. He pounded him out with punches and elbows. So I'm eating this this ceviche style crow, not in the form of of just that he won the fight, but he knocked out Darian Caldwell. Nobody had knocked out Darian Caldwell, even if it was roundabout stuff. That uh. It's some it's some spicy. It's a nice spicy. It hits your tongue, but it doesn't burn. So I'm I'm okay with it. Yeah, that's uh yeah, not not a bad one there. Actually, you guys kind of took some of the the options I was having to to flavor crow. So I I really I guess I'll go to tactical decisions that I was very surprised by. Uh Tyrone Spong and Sergey Karatanov. The the expected result, I expected Karatanov to implement a ground game and pound pound out to the, to the victory but i was very surprised about was uh spung's frequent kicking i thought that was just th th like that you just wouldn't do that simply because you know that leg is going to get snatched um to if am i remembering this correctly like he hasn't fought a kickboxing match since he broke his leg in glory yeah not he went straight and, he, to boxing. and he's gone straight to boxing right this guy who's boxed for what the better part of what six seven years uh, exclusively two titles. I mean, he's he's been legit, yeah, like like a legit boxer, like, undefeated. I, I think, yeah, yeah. I I thought I thought this would be a showcase of his hands in MMA more than anything else. And while he did throw some punches, it was not. It it, it just seemed like the proper thing to do against a guy who you know for a fact is going to try to drag you to the ground, um, and you know is looking to catch those kicks, so you punch him. That's what I thought was going to happen. It did not, and. The, the same result that I expected, just in a different way. So there we go. All right, fellas, now it's time to uh, transition into the greatest title segment in all of media history. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons. This is where we share something that surprised us or, ironically, did not over the course of the past week. Um, ben, um, if you've got one ready, I will begin with you. What's your I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons, this week? Well, I will just throw out there on you know like kind of piggybacking on your eating crow segment there was an obvious path to victory for sergey haritanov just push spong over sit on his chest and punch his skull into jelly i just didn't expect him to take it like that surprises me more than the out the actual outcome of the fight i thought there was every chance that spong was just going to starch him um because haritanov he loves his boxing Lo like loves his own boxing like you know and with good reason for the most part i figured he'd just hang out on the feet too long and just get concussed so yeah i i am legitimately surprised that he just did the sensible thing and took the path of no resistance all right jay please share with us your i'm not surprised mr falcons this week so i'm leaving the active fight game and i'm going to highlight something i wrote about for sure dog 
uh, back at the beginning of this month. Uh, it's an article you can look up. I think we'll link it. I'm going to say we'll link it on, on this this uh, description of this video called See You in Court. And it's a special of my series of the FF Files, uh, which is an analysis. I work with a bunch of the, the Sherdog Fight Finder staff, and we gather stories together about the most ludicrous, ridiculous things that our team gets. And we receive something uh, from, from an organization called the World Grappling, Grappling Organization in Iran. And it's a very problematic, <laughs> troubling, pained. Um, uh, Mr. Duffy is familiar with them. Uh, they were they they blurred the lines of MMA. They changed the rules. Uh, they did a whole bunch of bizarre things. They staged fights with children. Children. I don't mean like fourteen year olds. I mean like nine eight, year olds. Nine. Yeah. Gnarly. And they and they actually had the audacity to try and claim one of those was a professional fight. I saw the footage myself when it was, it was showed to me. So. Um, I wrote the article. I broke down the whole thing. I, I pulled the stories. I talked to the staff, and, and we went through it. And um, this was a guy who threatened to sue. He was very upset because we said, okay, this is we can't do this. There was a situation where it turned out the fighters were on the ground, and one fighter was just laying prey. And the not the referee, not the corner, not the coach, nobody involved, the promoter sitting at the table waved his hand to say this fight's over it's not competitive and the fight's over you win the fight this actually happened at an event where the iranian dana white said no you win the other guy isn't putting up a fight so that was the straw that, that broke the camel's back and he said all right we can't do this anymore so they threatened to sue they threatened to to, to, to just burn everything down. Quote, I have no desire other than defeat and failure and destruction of Sherdog. Sherdog is spelled wrong, by the way. So, why am I not surprised, Mr. Falcons? Because we've learned from sources close to the situation in Iran, because there are other Iranian organizations out there, uh, they all work with the government in some fashion, WGO has shuttered completely. Sold off their cage, sold off their contracts, sold off everything they have, and abandoned ship completely. And why am I most not surprised? Because according to the translation I received, the guy who did it, the guy who threatened us, Mehdi Udbashi, um, pronunciation may vary, uh, fled and may or may not have paid people for their services, for their time, for their fights, for their whatnot. So grifter's going to grift. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons. <laughs> In fairness, I mean, one of those fights between eight-year-olds, I think one of them did have a beard because it was Iran, so it was kind of hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do. I, I made sure to post on that article a video of the children fighting that he claimed there was a professional fight. It's, I think it, the other one might have had chest hair. Huh. He, maybe. It's, so, Ben, when, when did you start growing facial hair? Well, I was like 26. Oh, okay. <laughs> a Asia's going to Asian, man. Oh, exactly. Like Benson Henderson, Benson Henderson could tell you the struggle of being a half Asian in this world. See, <laughs> see I had my first my first sprouts around like 12. So it just started growing in. But yeah. All right. Well, all right, fellas. Well, um, Pat, because um, I don't really have an I'm not. Well, actually, you know, I do have one. Comes courtesy Kevin Holland. Um, affectionately known as Big Mouth to a lot of people. Um, Kevin Holland did something that is equally surprising and not surprising. He actually responded to an online troll, a gentleman who was in his DMs, calling him all sorts of names, saying he was ducking him. Kevin Holland invited him to his gym where he proceeded to work him over in a grappling match, choking him unconscious. I believe it was like an arm triangle that, that did it or Thing was an arm triangle, if I'm remembering the, the, the video correctly. Um, and talking shit to him the entire time that he's beating him, even slapping him on the stomach at one point, uh, toward the man blacking out. Um, I'm I'm surprised that he responded to a troll, but I'm not surprised that the troll got worked. And and Hans, I'm get, I'm not surprised that Kevin Holland is the fighter to respond to the troll. And oblige him. Every time this happens, it's wonderful. I'm still surprised that you dummies are in DMs of professional fighters, killers, people who are trained and they make a living at beating people unconscious, choking them and ripping limbs off like they are trained to do this. This is their full time job. Uh, well, maybe not full time if they're fighting the UFC, but you, you get the drift. Um, why are you doing this? You hobbyists that play a couple EA sports games and you've been to a karate class or two. You don't want that smoke. Knock it off. 
Please knock it off. And then it, actually don't. don't knock it off. Keep doing it so I can enjoy the footage. Like, World do you Star. think you become tough by osmosis? Like, it, it's it's ridiculous. And I, I don't understand the mindset at all of just, like, talking shit to fighters on Twitter. I mean, I spend a lot of time making fun of things that I think are silly in this sport. But I make it a point never to say something about a fighter that I wouldn't say to their face. Yeah. That's you know, a very important rule. Like, e either because I think they, they'd laugh, you know, or because I'm... I would be willing to take the L and take the ass kicking because it's just so funny. Like, <laughs> at no point do I think that, like, you know, <laughs> all I need to do is just get in, my, you know, my, my one super death blow and I, I can put away, like, this professional fighter. No, that's not how it works. And watch them out, wanna, folks. You want to be the best, you got to beat the best, man. You got to... <laughs> I, I think I, if, I, if I recall the details of the story, uh, Holland actually paid for the guy's ticket to come out. Oh, so, wow. That's so even. Gave that's him a bus ticket beautiful. or whatever. I mean, it wasn't quite as as, as uh, destructive as Charla Rosa fighting the internet troll. Yeah. But it was pretty it was pretty good. I'm and okay. like Dominic Cruz, I think he, he yeah. beat up a guy who claimed to be like an jiu-jitsu <laughs> master. He like head kicked him uh, unconscious or something. Like imagine being that guy and that bus ride back home. Like funny, first of all, funny that you took the bus. That you like, you you got on a greyhound to to go over there and get your ass whooped. But like, how demoralizing does that greyhound ride back home have to be? Like, you just you're sitting there, you you bruised up, you banged up, your ego was destroyed. I mean, it probably shrunk a little bit too because you know you you've lost testosterone. Um, it's like, and you're just sitting there on the greyhound, like one of the most miserable experiences that you can experience. Period. With this on your on your conscience, with with this thing shrinking up. Get it out Shrink of it up. He would have been smooth like a Ken doll down there. That shit was gone. <laughs> it like gone. inverted. Speaking of Ben Smooth, <laughs> got an Henderson. innie. Turned your Audi into an innie. <laughs> That's how demoralizing this shit was. And you're on the Greyhound, so you got to be like, how close do I want to sit to the bathroom? You try to yeah. get that equidistant from the door in the bathroom because those yeah. are the two worst parts of a Greyhound bus. <laughs> and you got and you got like a, a, a meth addict sitting next to you. You've got you know on across from you, you got some some grandmother who. Who hasn't seen her, her her grandkids for like twelve years, and she wants to talk your head off the whole she time. She wants to ask you what you've been up to this weekend. Yeah. Oh, where are you coming from yeah. this week? And yeah, you so have to explain yourself kicked. because yeah. she's going to talk to you. You got you got sixteen year old runaways uh, sitting behind you making out the whole time. Like this is terrible, and you had to endure this after getting your ass whooped for talking too much shit. Life is beautiful. And here's the thing. The troll, in theory, may have wanted people to know his name to gain some notoriety about it. I don't know his name. I don't care to know his name. I don't think it's out there. That's even better. Like, the one thing he could have gained is internet fame, and people don't at all care who this guy is. <laughs> beautiful. Got that ass whooped for nothing. I feel demoralized right now. Just that oh. entire vivid description. It's just like... <laughs> You can see it. You can see it happen. His shoulders are his shoulders it's are like, in like this because he's really, really disappointed with the Because you know, like like every time you grapple, like at some point someone's shoulder like bumps your nose and you're like having a little having a little trouble like getting the sniffing down right. And you're sitting by the bathroom and you could smell that blue liquid that they put in the in the porter potty in there. You could smell that mixed with the urine and, and mixed with the Red Bull and all the stuff that's going on in there. Um, <laughs> there's a palm print on his side when he oh. got slapped by, by Holland. Oh, my God. And it's, and it's, 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 all, like warm. it's all It's kind of warm. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and like it, the seatbelt is rubbing up against it. It's like, what, yes. what, a, what a miserable, miserable life. You loser. <laughs> oh, wow. I hope you enjoyed that great helm. Um, oh, I hope so. All right, Pat. Um, balls in your court. What is your? I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons moment this week. <laughs> Just gotta compose myself for a minute. God. Um, so, but my, uh, I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons. I, I am not surprised that Jake Paul has, you know, made more more waves in terms of trying to say he's gonna help with fighter pay and calling out Dana. Did a, a diss track music video, right? That is out there now yeah which fire. is just <laughs> fire <laughs> i've not listened is it bad it's pretty bad it's I, awful I but it's, it's so right bad a story about it so bad it's good yeah it, do, it does like i agree out, like falling in and out of love with you good bad falling out of love with you uh mm, mm, that's a good question actually carry on bad uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not surprised he's done all that what I am surprised about is that 
he's you know makes this statement that he's bought Endeavor stock with uh, Jeffrey Wu, I believe is his name from Engine One. Uh, which is an activist investor group. They've got a fair amount of money. They Engine One has made some waves for getting seats on the board of Exxon Mobil, um, and people are eating it up. Which lame, you know, the the layman fan, I, ex- I expect to say, oh, he's going to change everything. It's going to be awesome. But then Ariel Hawani goes out and starts saying like, this is, yeah, this is huge. This is whatever. Aaron Bronstetter actually calls him out a little bit, and then Hawani retweets. All this stuff about Exxon Mobil and stuff, and it's like, no, that's not how this works at all. The you, you, all you have to do is take a five-minute Google search to look about when Endeavor went public, and in their own prospectus, which is is rare that a company ever does this because it means they're selling it as a highlight point, and usually it's going to make investors upset. In their own prospectus, they state that they have all these different shares of class, and one of the the driving factors is that Ariel Hawani, Patrick Whitesell, and then Silver Lake Partners together own all of these Class Y shares, which are worth 20 to 1 vote-wise. So if you go buy an Endeavor share right now, you get one vote. They have a ton of 20-vote shares that they hold. It's 89% of the voting rights. And unless Jake Paul has somehow managed to buy some of those Class Y shares, which I cannot imagine has happened with all the shit he's talking, that you can't do anything. You could literally buy all outstanding Endeavor stock shares and you still would not be able to assign one board seat with that voting power. So mm-hmm. it takes very little research to confirm this, right? There's, there were a ton of stories about it when Endeavor went public. I wrote something on it. Uh, a bunch of people know about this stuff. And Helwani's out there retweeting this garbage and saying like, yeah, it's good. Man, this could change everything. It can't change a thing. It cannot change a thing. I, uh, God, it's it's the worst when the most prominent journalist in our sport goes out there and just tweets BS and doesn't know what he's talking about. And this this is um this is definitely not characteristic of Vigilante Hilwani. I'm a big no. fan of Vigilante Hilwani. He's he's Me out too. there burning yeah. bridges and I love yeah. it. Um I, I want to bring things full circle from last week um on, on this topic. So last week I I can't remember what we were talking about at the time, but I referenced a conversation that I just had with, with our friend Kristen King and and it was like and it added some value to what we were talking about. She actually DM me like right when we were about to record, or right when we started recording, and with a quote, uh, this is this is from Nick Baldwin's Twitter account, another friend of the show, but I guess he's he was live tweeting something from uh, from the MMA Hour. Jake Paul was guesting, and he said that his investment in Endeavor was quote a oh, low six figure. six figure amount uh, as quote unquote a starting point. Um, so he actually, I mean, literally no power whatsoever. The only hope I'd have for this. Um, as far as affecting any change or just disrupting things, I was hoping he just bought enough shares to be included on some investor conference call, and he could just troll Dana the whole time, and he could just just act an ass at some point and get get him riled up that way. That was my best hope, because um, that would be very good entertainment. So he he will be on those investor calls, but the problem is is that they screen those investor calls, and so unless he gets a proxy to who's going to be screened and, and given the green light, and then he hops on instead of whoever the name is. There's no way in hell Endeavor's ever going to let him on that investor call. He'll probably Next find up. a way to do it. But Next up is Pake Joel from Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is Logan Paul. From, from... <laughs> <laughs> like, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is a billion-dollar company. There is – it's – it's. I don't know what – I can't. I can't figure out actually what the end game is here anymore because the, there's no. It's 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 a personal gain. It's a personal brand thing. It's like an investment opportunity for him, mm-hmm. and because it, under the expectation that Endeavor is going to grow, because they have and they continue to do so. That's. I mean, that's it. This. It's. It's just. No. It essentially it's, feels like PR. Yeah. For, it's, a, oh, it's, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's two. It's two birds mm-hmm. and one stone. Yes. You put in an investment amount, you get returns. As the UFC continues yeah. exploding fires and right. continues with their sixteen percent of of revenue share, um, Jake Paul gets more money. 
In the yeah. meantime, he can criticize Dana and the UFC for not paying fighters enough money. So he's profiting from the same system that he's criticizing. Yeah. The problem is that a lot of people aren't smart enough to connect those dots and will and won't see it as what it is, which is simple PR, simple way to just troll and just get under his skin and make headlines and at the same time drive talent toward his promotion operations all the disgruntled ufc yeah. talent that's there that wants to get paid more especially ones that are headed out their door are are going to be looking to jake as a way to make more money when it's all said and done so he's he's recruiting he's pissing people off he's he's drying driving headlines and making money in different way like making money multiple streams by this move so this is this is what he's doing and he's pretty damn good at this this point so you're saying that he needs to get a bus ticket to go grapple Kevin Holland. That's the troll level he's reached. <laughs> I mean, this is this is this is like this is like showing up to the gym with a tank. Um <laughs> yeah, he he didn't he didn't just take a bus ticket over to to Kevin Holland. Like he's he he showing up. He, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he took came like, on the, the chopper on the, the aircraft gold, carrier, no like, limit like tank. Yeah, the gold no limit <laughs> tank or or he like paratrooped into the gym or something. Like this is this is a different level. All right, paratrooped in with Sergey Caratano. Mm. He's a paratrooper. Uh -huh. uh, he, he, he definitely looks like too. an ex-paratrooper. Yeah. Yeah. Former paratrooper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He actually, he, he actually, said that, and it took less than one second for me to just instantly know that it's true. Like, just in my bones. Like, yeah, he definitely was. Like, like Crow Cop <laughs> was an anti-terrorist police officer. You're like, yeah, yeah you were. Yeah, and, um, and yes, who sir, can, you were. <laughs> who else can join? Um, Oh, man, why, why am I forgetting his name? Fought in the UFC. He was like a like a special forces Brazilian cop. No, no, not oh, Tim oh, Kennedy. Uh, Paulo Tiago. Paulo Tiago. Yeah. yeah. I was about yeah. to say Paulo Filo and I was like, no, no, that, no. that's not that's not I right. mean, he's, he's, he's been, been around a paranormal the a lot. You can't you can't <laughs> he's like a paranormal guy specialist. Yeah. He's not He's been on the other side I think of yeah. a of a paratrooper's gun um <laughs> with with his with his exploits. But anyway, let's keep things pushing. Kamaru Usman, current welterweight champion, has uh, been making some some headlines lately uh by talking about going up to 205 and, and saying he thinks he can beat uh, Jan Blockovich, the reigning UFC uh, light heavyweight champion. Are we buying any of this or are we blowing smoke? Because I'm ready to light up and, and puff out. I wouldn't want to see him fight Glover Teixeira for who, who is the, the champion. Oh, yeah, right yeah, now. go over, go over. I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. well, it's weird because he's six feet tall, bricked out, and could easily, you know, not cut weight and probably be 194 and 195. So it's not crazy. And he wrestled uh, in, in, in college at um, 185. So it's not a crazy, bizarre switch. And you can understand why, because he doesn't want to fight Israel Adesanya, Nigerian, the whole connection like that. I get that. So... In the crazy scheme of things, I can see it make more sense than some other bizarre things like that. Do I want to see it? No, we still got work to do. Leon Edwards is going to fight him in like 2025 or something. So he's still got that to work for, look forward to. But uh, I don't know. Do you guys like it? Do you, or I, do you, or, I feel like this is the UFC fighter version of, of, of hear, hear me out for a second, of Paul saying the thing about the buying into the whatever and to get himself in the headlines. I feel like this is a UFC fighter version of a sensationalist headline to put him in the news and that won't actually cost him anything. Like, I know, obviously, the stakes are different, but I look at this more as a, hey, don't forget about me. I mean, hey, 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 like hmm. everything Conor McGregor says the last, like, six months or so is a, hey, hey, hey. It doesn't seem to me like something that actually would ever, ever, ever happen. I, I wouldn't go with as as far as saying it be, saying that way because I think that's too deliberate. Okay. I think this is this is I think he honestly feels this way. Fighters are delusional in in, okay. in a lot of ways, and they're they're they have an inflated sense of what they're capable of. Um, granted that 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 inflated sense comes with good reason to to an extent, but Karan Usman probably seriously sits back and tells himself that yes, I could be the two old five pound champion. I know he he targeted Blagovich. I mean, he, I know he very specifically mentioned him. Right. Like, That's I can why beat that was weird. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean the fighter fighters delusion, even if their job is dependent on them being grossly self-confident to the point of, you know, lunacy doesn't mean that that lunacy is correct in any way, shape or form. Like that's just not going to happen. I think, I think more the guilty party is 
of a reporter listening to this and actually treating it like it's real news because fighters say crazy things all the time. Well, <clears throat> of all people to be the voice of reason, Ali Abdelaziz came out and said, yeah, he and Adesanya are both Nigerian, but I bet he'd fight him. This is still business. I don't think it'll really happen, but it's not off the charts ridiculous. I mean, who weighs more this morning right now? Usman or Adesanya, wherever they are. Uh, they're probably about equal. I would not say they're equal. I, I, I think Usman absolutely outweighs Adesanya. Like Adesanya walks around to like 195 pounds. Yeah. Usman walks around yeah, more than true. that. I, I would even say who weighs more this morning? Kamaru Usman or Rashad Evans? Oh, Rashad, Rashad is like, Rashad looks like he's like 160 right now. Yeah, so. like Rashad weighed in like 203 or 204. So that's one of those. I didn't cut weight for it kind of fight. Yeah. So. Right. And Boy. that's around Kamaru Usman's walking weight. Like, it's it's not off the charts ridiculous, but no. Like, <clears throat> if he does anything, he will fight at 185. And, yeah, he would fight Adesanya if it were for, if it were a title. Like, teammates will fight each other if it's for a title. I I think that Kamaru Usman's bigger than Rashad Evans. Just, I'm talking, I'm not, I know we yeah. just said no, he's that. Taller. He's taller. He's taller. He's taller. He's heavier. Yeah. Yeah. He's more yeah. muscular, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think, I think that is, and we just saw him beat a blown up 185. Okay, it was a, you know, Gabriel Checker. It's not a light heavyweight. Man, you guys are turning me on this. Yeah. Wait, okay, let, let's get, let's get, let's get huge. stupid here for a second. I'm sorry. Let's get stupid for a second. Uh, number 10 light heavyweight, Johnny Walker, Kamara Usman. I think Usman could win that fight if he doesn't get hit in the face by a flying knee. I know this is totally way off where we're going here. But I'm just thinking in terms of, of of light heavyweight, how he would do it. Oh, that's weird. That's weird, guys. I don't I don't like it anymore. I think it's tough because honestly, I I, I truly believe Kamaru thought and still thinks that he could win 205 belt. I'm sure he thinks he could win a 185 too, but he, again, has a friendship with Adesanya, so maybe he's skipping it. But I, I'm with Ben here uh, that if it came down to it for business, they'd, they'd fight each other. Um, but the one thing that I think is important here, right, is that Usman is cutting all that weight and then fighting smaller guys. And I think that's a big issue. We, we just saw that with Adesanya and... Um, Jan, right, is is Adesanya couldn't stop the takedowns and couldn't do much once Jan was on top of him. We've seen Adesanya get taken down much, much quicker from guys like Vittori or, um, well, really, he's the one that's most successful at it. He's, he's blocked a lot of other takedowns and been able to use his raw strength to get past people. I am curious to see how Usman's raw strength without cutting weight would do against some of these bigger guys. Cause that's where I think you could end up with, okay, Usman is, is dominating somebody like Walker, but if Walker can shrug him off just by pure force, then I think Usman's in a bit of trouble. And I think that's where I don't know how he would do. I don't want to see him against Glover. I don't want to see him against the champion. If he was going to go up to 205, I'd like to see him against a Walker or somebody just to see what that looks like. But I really feel like even though he's bigger and he's cutting a lot of weight, a huge advantage he has and the reason why he cuts that weight is because he's so much bigger and then he has the strength advantage to just dominate and do whatever on the ground, right? Um, I, I don't know what happens when that goes away. We've seen his striking improve, but hasn't improved enough. And again, against bigger guys, it's going to be harder to to knock them out hypothetically too so and eating those shots on those bigger guys is going to be different colby covington yes. punching you in the face is much different than a tiago santos like it's just it's just not the same world like i don't as as highly as i think of kamaru usman and you know standing in front of him he is a very big person but standing in front of johnny walker standing in front of jan blagovich standing ryan, in front of so ryan span type right mm -hmm. I, I, like i'm just not I, it just it just it it's something that sounds good on paper until it when, when we're laying out okay what they walk around at and whatnot until we actually see them standing next to one another because I, I guarantee you Kamaru Usman at 205 uh weighing stepping on the scale at, at 205 pounds looks a lot different the next day th than Johnny Walker stepping on that scale at 205 pounds and then yep. walking into the octagon standing yep. in front of each other I guarantee by the time a ceremonial weigh-ins we'll see that there is a huge difference in Kamaru Usman might have been off a lot more than he can chew. Um, 
and, and if he does get past certain people, like I mean Johnny Walker being a, a decent example, it's a pure skill thing. Like that is totally mm-hmm. devoid of what physical deficiencies are, are going to be very clear when they're standing in front of each other. I know he kind of broke things. We, I mean, the UFC kind of broke things when two division champions became really, 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 really popular and everybody tried to do it. But I wish, I miss Anderson Silva moving up to 205 to take on guys. Like, was he wasn't fighting for the title. He was fighting James Irvin. He was fighting, he was fighting Forrest Griffin. And and I, I would love to see an Usman fight against, oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, 185 Darren Till. Uh, mm-hmm. Something like, just like, you know, if 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 the champion is devoid of contenders because there's a log jam and they're trying to figure things out, I would love to see the champion test out of that weight class. I would, I would love to see Valentina Shevchenko go to 135, not to fight for the title. I don't want to see that right now. But I don't know, give her Caitlin Fiera, just a a a a sort of a, a, a name that you could test out on that new division while you're working on it. It won't hurt your stock in your division. I, maybe I'm crazy, but I, I like the idea of that. And that's that's where I like the idea of an Usman. Okay, okay, fine. You really have the time and the free time and no challengers to test that out? Okay, put your money where your mouth is. Fight Derek Brunson. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 I mean, all of this is silly with yeah. Leon Edwards out there, of with course. Vicente Luque yes. out there. You know, with with names that make sense standing in front of him for for Bell, and I'm and, and I don't even want to get into a, a third match with Colby. I'm, I don't wouldn't even find it necessary considering how the last two went down. But there are at least two guys yeah. at at 170 that deserve their attention. So uh, I'm I miss me miss me with the with the move up talk. Especially gonna, if that move up is the two hundred five. Gonna forget Hamzat Jemayev, man. Are you gonna, you're just gonna leave. Jem- <laughs> uh, if he yeah. fights Gilbert Burns, he's gonna be a pretzel. That's yeah, the like, wrong matchup in May is Burns yeah. and, and Shemayev, and that's just yeah. No. yeah, yeah. When Shemayev, when when Shemayev is a is a top ten or top five fighter, then we'll talk about him and Kamaru Usman. Until then, <laughs> it's still all theory. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. We should oh, be fighting for the belt right now. Just oh, saying. Right. <laughs> well, someone's going to be real mad in the comments. <laughs> Somebody's going to be real mad. To that, I say I don't care. All right. All right, fellas. Um, let's keep things pushing here because the UFC is back uh, this weekend. So let's give a, a brief amount of love to this car. Jack Hermanson and Sean Strickland are in the headlining spot. Uh, who, who comes out the victor? I, I think. <laughs> wait, wait, who? Wait, who said they have Hermanson here? I have Hermanson here. Oh, all right, Ben, you take the floor. I want, I want to hear this. Uh, Strickland, since coming back from his long injury layoff uh, last year, has been ripping through the competition. It's been a good thing for him to just settle in at 185 and say, "Okay, I'm, I'm a middleweight." Uh, just. I think Hermanson is a large step up from anyone Strickland has fought since he's been back. Uh, has more routes to victory. Like he's an extremely wily fighter on the ground. While he's not a huge uh, middleweight, I think he's going to be uh, physically stronger than Strickland. He's a fundamentally sound striker. I mean, Strickland's going to have the advantage in power and hand and foot speed. Like if he lamps Hermanson in 90 seconds, I'm going to feel really dumb. But I'm picking Hermanson, one of the more cerebral and opportunistic fighters out there, to to find a way to win this one. All right. Any any other takers? Who who gets that win? I I will disagree, and it's based on Jack Hermanson's performance against Marvin Vittori, uh, because Marvin Vittori is shorter, uh, less power theoretically. Uh, lesser range was boxing up and, and doing some real damage and stunning uh, Hermanson on the feet several times in their fight. I don't believe he officially registered a knockdown. I think it was just he, he might have gotten one. Um, oh, geez. He might have gotten one in the first round. Like he's kind of snuck in and stunned him. But I don't know if that was like a drop to the knee kind of thing. Uh, I see Strickland's. I mean, we're going to talk about it. Then the commentators are going to talk about it. Everybody's going to talk about it. I'm going to probably write about it, about his technical boxing that Strickland has that is really befuddling guys he's going up against. Uh, and I, I think he can work his reach. As long as this fight doesn't go down to the ground in any fashion, 
I, I see that Strickland has a very clear path to victory. Um, but Str- I mean, Strickland's never been submitted. He's fought some some tough submission threats, grappling tough guys. Um, you know, he he outlasted, uh, but still fell short to Kamara Usman and and I think uh, Alex Garcia. He fought. I'm trying to think of other submission threats that are that were out there. He's run up against. Um, I see this being a, a, a good on the feet, probably a, like a third round knockout kind of thing from just an accumulation of of getting beat up and and Strickland yelling at him. I think that'll be demoralizing. And and Hermanson, Herm, Hermanson, he's a really from what everything I know about him, the interview, the whole stuff, he seems like a really nice guy. And when somebody is screaming at you, go down, go down, come on, you you can't take this. Whatever he's yelling at him, I think that's gonna hurt his feelings and demoralize uh, Hermanson. And I, I feel like that 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 Tarzan's going to keep moving forward with uh, a a good display of his boxing again. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to go with Strickland here, but I I think it's for part of the reason that Jay said, but in in terms of keeping it off the ground, that to me is one of the biggest reasons is, you know, Strickland's looking at something towards a 84% takedown defense or something like that. 82 is, is what it says on UFC stats. Um, hasn't been, been taken down since Usman. Sorry. To yeah, 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 exactly. Hasn't been taken down since Usman. And then when you look at the other fights, Garcia, who took him down three times, a couple others, he only stayed on the ground for like three minutes total. And he had himself had three minutes of control time, did reversals, things. I think that's going to be a huge factor because I think Strickland's pressure and the way he just keeps coming at you and throwing shots. If Hermanson can't get him down and is just constantly shooting for takedowns and getting stuffed over and over, I think it is going to wear him out. I think it's going to demoralize him. And over the course of five rounds, similar to what Jay said, you know, Hermanson had a great stand-up fight with Vittori that was super fun. But if he tries and does that with Strickland, I think Strickland just outboxes him all day. So I've got Strickland here. I think it is a fun fight, and I could easily see if Hermanson can get him down getting a crazy submission out of nowhere. I don't think it's, oh, it's going to be a blowout or anything. Um, but I've got to lean Strickland just because his takedown defense is so good. And looking back at some of the other, you know, people he just absolutely stuffed, you know, Joe Co, Brendan Allen, who's known for takedowns, he stuffed him a bunch. That type of stuff, I think, bodes well against Hermanson here. Yeah, I, I've got to agree with you guys on, on that one. Um, I, I don't really see the path to victory for Jack Hermanson if he can't get it to the floor and if he can't keep it there. If you have trouble getting the fight to the floor with Strickland, which everyone has trouble with that, if you have trouble keeping him there, which everyone does, if they're able to get it there, um, you're forced to to stand there and trade hands with him. And and that just doesn't seem like a, a good night at, at the office for Hermanson. So I, I, I see this being over third, late third, early fourth. Is, is kind of what, what I'm thinking. All right, fellas. So let's see. Here. Is there any fight that you want to highlight before we uh, call it yes. quits for the, for the day? Yes, I right, do. Jay. I really <laughs> so do. I'm taking this fight so you guys don't take it. I know you're all paying attention to it. It's mine. I'm going into it, and I do not care. It is a main card, absolute battle royale in the middleweight division between Sam Alvey and Phil Hawes. It is... Fight IQ, negative 45 type fight, and I cannot wait for whatever happens for it. I, I'm i a weird fight fan. I don't hate fighters. I don't dislike whatever something's going on. I don't sour on them if their game plans get cruddy. I don't dislike Gray Maynard if he starts fighting conservatively. I don't loathe Clay Guida for some of his performances. I don't hate Sam Alvey for what he does because he does what he does. And son of a gun, he's going to keep doing that. He's going to go with a long right, long left hand and a quick right hook, and that's that is his bread and butter, and it has made him lose six fights and draw in his last. So it is Sam Alvey to a T against Megatron Hawes, a guy who can fall into a knockout. Like we've seen it happen against Julian Marquez, where he walked into a head kick. We saw it happen to Chris Curtis when Chris he was working Chris Curtis over, and Chris Curtis caught him with with a couple shots. Uh, I. It's going to sound weird. I'm not sure who to pick in this fight because both of these fighters can lose a fight at any second. Both of these fighters can give up the fight 
And I don't mean that totally disparaging, just like mostly disparaging, because I am genuinely excited to see what happens when the dust settles between these two guys. Um, because this is a fight that I could see Sam Alvey winning it and getting like seven more fights in the UFC because of it. So uh, welcome back to the Sam Alvey era, 4.0 or 5.0. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to a very sloppy, just just ridiculous fight that has no sort of exhibition of anything regarding technique or strategy i am I'm, I'm really hoping that sam alvey loses just to see how long this losing streak is going to go um before they consider whether or not this man is ufc caliber i, I just really want to say hey, okay i'm sorry adonis I, I mean i think that hurt his feelings um let's we'll say you guys stand up in here before we uh before we sign out there uh well i'm i'm just chuckling at how much that that fight hurt Ben soul when Jay was <laughs> talking about it. You could just see, you could see a little bit of him died that day. Uh, for me, I am, I'm very excited. I know, uh, tough is not a popular subject on, on this or any podcast really. Uh, but, um, Brian battle versus Trishan Gore, uh, was the original ultimate fighter finale. Gore had to pull out, I think that's a great fight. I think it'll be fun, um, action-packed. Everything the battle's been in throughout all of the tough season, and then the finale especially, has been super fun to watch. Uh, Gore's got good power, and, and it should be a fun stand-up war. I think that'll be a low-key banger. I don't know who wins that necessarily. I'm leading battle, but um, but I think it's going to be super fun as long as it goes on because those two seem to like to throw and just stand in the pocket. That should be you know, the makings of a great fight. All right. Anyone else before uh, Ben? Yeah, any anything before we we get out of here? <laughs> ben is really looking forward to Alexis Davis versus Julius Soliarenko. I am really looking forward to Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't blame you. So am I. All right. So that's going to do it for this edition of Unleash. Um, Pat, thank you for for joining us on the Walkout Network again. Of course, open invite anytime. Um, you're welcome to come back on. You can check him on the scrap. You can check him on Sherdog for the uh, Fight Business Podcast. Of course, Ben and Jay, you know, their work is on Sherdog. Of course, you can check me out on MMA On Point. So, uh, like, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, tell that friend to tell 10 more friends. Stay beautiful, stay positive, and stay sexy. I'll see you when I see you. Peace.